Greetings, fellow adventurers, and welcome to the debut episode of the Mind Your Manners podcast. This is a podcast where we'll dig into role-playing games that are of particular interest to me. Uh, this is my little corner of the internet to discuss uh, the, you know, the various games that are appealing to me at this moment in time. Uh, lately, that's been a lot of Harn World and Harn Master, uh, so we're going to dig into that later in this episode with Kerry Mould and Richard Luschek, who are writers and illustrators on that product. Uh, future episodes, we'll probably dig into some other systems like Traveler and Pendragon, Call of Cthulhu, of course, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but there's a wide, diverse range of games out there, and I want to make sure that uh, those are being seen out in the wild. So just real quick, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Kerry Dolan. I've been an RPG player for 14-ish years. Um, I actually... My first purchase uh, would have been right around third edition, the launch of that. Um, maybe it was right at the end of the TSR era, but I, I didn't really get into it until uh, fourth edition and um, rapidly expanded uh, outwards from D&D to, to other systems there. So there's a, a large number of things that I have interest in. Um, sometimes they skew a little crunchier, a little more simulation-y, but I also, you know, that pendulum swings way to the the other side, and there's also some story light or story-focused games uh, that I like as well. Um, I think it all just depends on what you want to emulate. So without further ado, let's head over to the interview with Kerry Mould and Richard Luschek. Welcome to the Mind Your Manners podcast. Um, with me today, I've got Kerry Mould and uh, Richard Luschek. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You are. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw it to Kerry first, because uh, I've got you on the top left of the screen here. But why don't you introduce yourself, how you came into the hobby, and how you found Harn? OK, well, uh, like you said, I'm Kerry Mould. Uh, I am one of the authors who uh, works for Columbia Games. Um, I have been involved with Harn in a writing sense since 2001, when I released my first fan article. Um, that was, uh, something I worked with, uh, a guy called Patrick Nielsen, who had a website called Swords and Shields at the time. And, uh, my first article was Lady of Paladins, which got a lot of attention and led to me writing a lot of other fan, uh, material. And then in 2004, I started writing for Columbia Games with the, uh, re-release of the Kingdom of Kaldor module. Um, so I've been, I've been involved with Harn. I, I found my first Harn book in, I think, 1983, somewhere around there with the, uh, cities of Harn. Um, I didn't know anything about Harn at the time. I was a kid playing, uh, D and D. Uh, I think we were playing original red box, uh, D and D, which I think Richard has right over his shoulder. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> and so, um, we used the cities of Harn for Every city in every fantasy campaign, um, except for Harn. We, ne we never played any Harn when I was, you know, a kid. Uh, and I kind of put it away and never even thought about it again until uh, in about 1999, 98, sometime around there, uh, Harn Manor came out and I saw it in my local game store. And I really liked the look of it. So I bought it, opened it up and immediately recognized the mapping style and said, I, I've seen this before. And so I went back and, and got uh, the uh, Old Cities of Harn book out of my collection, and that gave me the bug. And after that, I started collecting it like crazy and, and uh, bought everything I could find, and then realized that there wasn't much new being written at that time. And that's where I got into writing it. So, And are, are you considering yourself a professional writer by trade these days? Or is that more of, so, more of a hobby? This is a hobby. Uh, I, I'm actually a uh, uh, project manager. I manage uh, major capital projects for the Department of National Defense in Canada. So um, that's my day job. This is this is what I do for fun. Excellent, excellent. Well, well, thanks. Um, and I, I do want to make a note that we'll come back to just talking briefly about Harn uh, writers as as a group. Um, so that is kind of something that evolved out of the community. As I understand it, um, so yeah, so it, it you know uh, 
Columbia Games doesn't have uh, employees uh, per se as, as writers or mappers or artists. Um, instead, we're all freelancers who uh, do freelance work. But Harn is a, quite a complicated setting to, to get your mind around. And so you need uh, some sort of structure to, uh, to work together for the writers to cooperate, uh, to have editors and, and uh, canon checkers and stuff like that. So Harn writers evolved as a sort of a collaborative group of freelancers who work together. And uh, we put the way it works is, is we put together uh, a group of articles um, every three months. And then we, uh, once they've all been reviewed and prepared by the Harn writers, then we send them into Columbia Games. Uh, they do the final review and then it gets published as Harn Quarterly. Um, but that's done as a group of freelancers. So, yeah, that's fascinating. It's such a, a different model than what you see out there. Um, how, how large would you say the Harn Writers group is? Uh, it varies a little bit uh, from quarter to quarter as we have people come in, maybe who only write for one, one uh, you know, Harn Quarterly. But uh, we do have Richard is our full time artist, we have a full time mapper. And we have a full-time editor uh, who have stayed very constant over the last few years. Um, and then uh, the writing group varies anywhere from, I would say, four to eight. Uh, so there's, there's about a dozen of us who are involved, uh, you know, at any one time. Um, and that number, you know, varies, goes up and down. Um, we've also, I, I don't want to forget Matt, because Matt also does mapping as well as Bill. So uh, there are a couple mappers. Okay. Uh, Richard, let's throw it over to you. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, how you got into Harn, and uh, what you're doing today on the project. All right. Uh, well, my name is Richard Lushek, and uh, I I started, uh, you know, of course, like most people, my first thing was Dungeons and & Dragons, and I, it was uh, after, it was interesting, uh, in, in junior high, my seventh grade English teacher, who was kind of the first teacher who got us reading cool stuff so we were reading that's where we learned you know lord of the rings and sci-fi stuff and it was the first time like i was like oh wow you can read interesting things too you know fun fun cool fantasy stuff so he they did a thing at our at our i went to a really small farm school it was like in you know a school in the you know pretty rural area it was like actually my school was the 10th poorest school in ohio at the time i mean it's really uh an odd little place but it was sort of a you know even in the 80s it was kind of a mayberry feel to it you know there really just wasn't much happening but then uh they did these after school classes called uh and and the my seventh grade english teacher he decided to do a gaming group and it was everything from you know little war games to chess to he thought, well, let's do Dungeons and Dragons. So he started a Dungeons and Dragons thing. And then that became a regular thing. Like we would meet after school or on Saturdays and uh, play in the basement of the junior high. And we were playing Dungeons and Dragons for a long time. And shortly after that, we started playing a game called Dragon Quest. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Uh, and it was, it was interesting because it was, I always was confused by Dungeons and Dragons because... Like, what does the saving throw mean? Like, the rules were weird. They just weren't counterintuitive. They were kind of counterintuitive. Like, nothing really made sense to me. But then we started playing Dragon Quest, and it was percentage-based. So it was like you have a 60% chance to do this thing. And he had written his own world, and like everybody else, we found the Harn ads on the back of Dragon Magazine, and he started buying the supplements. And started. we started in Caldor, which is the place where a lot of people start I think and he bought he was buying all that stuff up you know so at the time you know I mean I was you know 14 or 15 at that you know or younger than that even and so he st we started playing there playing Dragon Quest in Harn and then he got the Harn Master Rules and the percentage base allowed us to easily convert the same characters over to Harn and we've been playing and, it, and it's funny because uh Mon this past Monday or this past Tuesday, I played with that same group. <laughs> so we've been playing, 
you know, since uh, what would that be? Like 1984. Um, and we've been, I've been playing with the same group since that time. And, you know, multiple campaigns, obviously, but actually not that many, only about five campaigns in that time. So we tend to play campaigns for a long time. But uh, so I played Harn, you know, all we, we took a break a little bit while I was in college. And then after college, we started playing Harn again. And about the time Carrie started writing, you know, Carrie was writing when there was that law in production time. And what would that be? That was like the, the early to mid 90s. There wasn't much being done by Columbia Games. And the fans kind of took over. So I saw online my character in the game. Um, we played in the Kaldoric Civil War and my character did really well. He was actually a, a war hero and ended when he was a Lorrainian and he ended up, uh, you know, he did so well. The, the new king gave him the, made him the Bishop of Abriel. And so at that time, I saw online that Patrick Nielsen was writing an article about Abriel. And I contacted him via email. I was like, I'm so excited about this. I, I, I you know, I was pretty early. I really hadn't done much illustration, but I said, I'll illustrate it for free because I want this done. And so he was like, yeah, I, you know, free might be too much. I don't, I mean, I, I have to see some of your work first. And so I did a few pieces and next thing you know, Patrick's hiring me for everything he's doing at the time. And I started, so we're, I'm just doing fan art. And then eventually Patrick kind of got the attention. He actually, I think he contacted Columbia Games and said, let's start publishing again. And he became the, at that time, the product editor and was kind of gathering a, a group of people together. And next thing I know, I'm the full-time illustrator for Harn. Now that, that was about 2000, 2000, 2001. So I've been doing it for about 23 years. Yeah. Were you an illustrator by trade at that point? Or I wasn't it... really. And it's funny. I went to art school and uh, I went to college for art and didn't really get what I wanted. I mean, you know, at that time, art college was more about, I don't know, expressing your, your feelings than it was doing actual, and I, you know, the stuff I, I liked realism. And so I was doing that and they were sort of not into what I was doing. So after I graduated, uh, I did a few things, but then I went and got classical training for three years in New Hampshire with a painter. And so my goal was to just become a painter, uh, you know, fine art painter doing still life landscape portrait type stuff. But I was really fascinated by illustration as well. So, you know, N.C. Wyeth and all the golden age illustrators, I was really into that. So, uh, so it was it's interesting because when i look at the stuff i was doing in 2000 it's a little crunchy you can tell i'm i'm sort of i was okay but uh a lot of that stuff makes me cringe as a, at this point when i see it now and luckily you know i've been doing it for so long i'm i'm getting to redo some of the stuff that embarrasses me from 20 years ago but i i sort of learned as i went when, once i got my good training as a painter i was able to kind of transition and start doing what I thought was capable work for Columbia games. Yeah. And Harn has a very particular style. I mean, yes, how, how, I mean, it, it, there's almost two, two separate styles. There's yeah. a lot of portraiture. Right. And then there's uh, kind of this, I don't know, pseudo medieval enlightened yeah. illuminated manuscript right. kind of set up to it. Right. Um, is that a fair assessment or would you categorize yeah, it? Differently? I, think so. I think I agree with that. I would say, I mean, I would say Eric Hotz, who was the first illustrator. And well, the two things that attracted me to Harn in the beginning were, uh, you know, obviously the early D&D stuff had some very cartoony, like high fantasy, crazy art. You know, I mean, some of the early stuff was even kind of almost psychedelic. It was, it was very, an unusual style. And Harn had a very, I mean, it almost felt like you were reading a history book. The art in there felt like real world stuff. And Potts did a great job. I mean, his, you know, his knights and his castles, you know, they felt like you could live in them. They weren't uh, super high fantasy. They felt grounded and real. And he did a medieval style too, but he did, his stuff was, uh, he did a lot of uh, like uh, etching. His stuff looked like medieval etchings, right? And so I, I love that stuff. And so when I got into it, I basically tried to mimic what he was doing. I, but 
my style at the time was a little bit more, I was a little bit more into hyper, you know, getting things to look realistic. His, even his figures were a little bit more cartoony, I would say. And so I liked more realism a little bit. So I pushed that part, but I followed his medieval look, but I kind of turned it more into the manuscript feel and away from the etching. So I try really hard to do art that looks like it's done by people living in the world of Harn. And so I like to do, and I, and kind of what I like to do that way is, uh, I don't know if, if you research a lot of medieval manuscripts, I mean, they were wrong, you know, and like, like, like they would describe a monster and like, or if they did an illustration of elephant, it looked wildly wrong when we see it now. And so I, I try to sneak that stuff into the Harn stuff too. So like if I draw the real monster and then I do a manuscript of the monster, it's usually incorrect and it like breathes fire where it does it in real life. You know, I try to add weird mythical things that the GM can use to help tell stories as well. So, but yeah, I think it's a good assessment of what Karn does. So it's not so much, you don't see a lot of uh, female knights in bikini chainmail in, in Harn. It's more, if there is a female knight, it looks like she could actually fight alongside the male knights. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's very grounded, and yeah, um, you know, let's let's kind of circle back a little bit and just you know what is Harn? Where did it come from? Um, just in brief, I know this has been covered by some other folks out there, but right. as I understand it, and and maybe this is apocrypha, but this Harn came out of kind of a reaction to that D and D absurd fantasy type stuff, the dungeon delving. It, it has those elements. It has pretty much all the elements that you're looking for, but it's very grounded. And I think I'd seen someone say somewhere that it was built from like the tectonic plates up as a world. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I know we have those maps, but whether or not that's that's actually yeah. true. Um, Terry might know more than me. What, I mean, what's your, you might know more well, about the early writings of it. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, Robin Crosby uh, was the person who created Harn. Um, and he started it as basically his own homebrew world, right? Uh, this was used for his own campaign. And it was, I think, like you said, a bit of a reaction to Dungeons & Dragons in that it was um, more grounded in reality. And it's basically, you know, if you if you look at his maps of uh Kathira the world Lithia the continent and you kind of squint a little bit the continent looks sort of similar to Europe and Harn falls into sort of the same place as where the British Isles would be and when you get to the the local kingdom level it feels very much like uh Norman England right that sort of 1100 AD ish time period um you know, it has some some uh, things that are a little bit different. It's it's guild system and some of its uh, technology is more of almost, say, 14th century. But it, it has that grounding. Like you see the fact that the proportion between the number of peasants who are doing a hard scrabble life, growing the, the food to create that tiny surplus to support that small nobility, that all feels right. Like and, and in the descriptions of the kingdom's very much emphasize that you know it's a hard scrabble medieval life in Harn, and yet there are fantasy type monsters. There are uh, um, you know all sorts of quests that you could go on. There are there are a, a, a dwarven kingdom and an elven kingdom. Um, there are dragons and stuff like that. But all of those feel very naturally part of a medieval world and uh you know big credit to uh to robin crosby i mean he was the one who laid that foundation down um and then uh you know he worked with tom Douglas from columbia games who helped put that into that sort of encyclopedia format um and created the the very first harn world uh booklets that, that were very the very first thing that came out and that gave you, you know, uh, at a very, very high level, it gave you the map of Harn, 
and uh, you know one or two paragraphs on each of the points marked on that map. And that was the starting point. And for a lot of us, that was it, right? That's all you had and everything else you made up yourself. And then over time, over the last 20, 25 years, we've been gradually fleshing that out and making that um, you know, more detailed while trying to stay with that same feeling of fantasy, but based in reality. So you can have all the cool things, but it still feels like a real place where, you know, people still go to work. They, you know, they trade at the marketplace, um, you know, for those few silver coins and uh, you know, uh, the players, everything they do have consequences in that world. Yeah. W one thing that's really interesting to me is that there's always, whenever you have a grounded setting, there's always this debate. Well, is it low fantasy? I, I think as I've, continue to read through these books the answer is decidedly no it is not low fantasy mm -hmm. it is grounded fantasy and that is a distinct difference between you know how things are presented um one thing that comes across you know as soon as you start looking at you know any of the books or or the pdfs um things are in motion mm -hmm. like that it it is you mentioned the economics of it. Um, every district, you know, as a generic term, has something going on. There's resources moving back and forth. There are interactions between all these polities. You've got um, many different players in there in terms of political actors. And the world jumps off at, a, at the same time for everyone's game. You know, the books are all set in 720 is the year right so not yeah. 721 720 right um so that that's something that's very different um than you know some of the other settings out there um and for me and that's something and that's something that we've kept very uh tight to uh mm -hmm. ever since the very beginning is that um all the books every source book ends on the first of new ZL, so first day of the new year uh in 720 that's it there's no there's no meta plot beyond that, and the another big part of it is as you say there's a lot of big things in motion, and those things are kind of frozen right at seven twenty, and how they fall on the other side of that new year is entirely up to the GM and the players. So you know there are, Caldor is on the verge of a of a potential succession crisis. There's, you know, uh, tension between between Retham and Kande and potential war. Um, you know, uh, the the king of Chibissa is is old, and his son has syphilis, and you know, both Meldrin and Kaldor want to take over the kingdom and make them part of their own. All of that is kind of just paused, and then go. You know, it's it's up to the the GM and the players as to how all those things fall out, and some of them, you know. King Miganath could hang on for 10 more years. You know, uh, who knows? Uh, it's all up to how you want to run your campaign. Yeah, and there's all sorts of theories out there if you go digging. Uh, you know, is he is he actually alive? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, why don't we talk about some of the things that you need to get started? So let's say we've got the buy-in from the players. We're going to go forward. What should we start with? Is the, is the 40th anniversary... We've got, well, there we go. That's kind of good enough. We've got the 40th anniversary Harn World um, and Harn Dex uh, book here. Two two big products in one setting versus something that's a rule system. So one thing that we didn't note yet is that y'all have built Harn World to be system generic. Um. It certainly has an implied system, I think, with with Harn Master being the RPG. Um, in in both of your games, are you running Harn Master or are you running other systems? We do Harn Master. Yeah. yeah, we're doing we're doing an earlier version of Harn Master actually, just because we're so used to it. But yeah, Harn Master. Okay. And, yeah. carrier, and what? Running? And when I run uh, Harn, I do it in Harn Master. I don't currently. We're currently doing an Earth Dawn campaign in in my face to face role playing group, uh, but uh, when I've run Harn for my group, 
Um, we, uh, we always do it at Harn Master. Um, but that being said, you're very correct, is that um, it's designed to use with any game system, right? It's a setting. Harn, first and foremost, is a setting. Um, and, uh, and I've known lots of people, we, uh, we have a regular get together for Harn, Harn fans in Kansas city. And, uh, one of the guys there is running apocalypse world. I mean, that's his favorite system for running it. It's, it's very fast. It's very easy, very easy for people to pick up and you can just run and go with it. Um, and I've seen people run it with D and D, um, Ars Magica is one of the systems that people seem to like to use with it as well. Um, There's a burning, burning wheel, burning, portal, burning wheel harn. There's a yep. Savage Worlds harn, and you yep. can find a lot of individual websites uh, that are specifically geared to using a system for harn. So, yeah, yep. there's lots of people doing different stuff, and it's interesting too because I I played in a couple system uh, game, sessions of the Apocalypse World harn. And Gen Con, and it's an odd system, but I have to say it completely changed the way I role play. I mean, one I I've been role playing a certain way for years, and we still play we still play with Harn Master, but the way that Apocalypse Rules works with Harn changed the way I role play forever. And so it's interesting when you start playing in other people's games and doing different systems, you might not change that system, but it affects it leaks over and uh it's, it's pretty fascinating and it just it's interesting that that kind of thing can all work in harn and everybody knows harn and it, it doesn't really change the world it just might change the way you play it it might change you know like some systems are more magic heavy and some systems are are less so so um uh it is interesting that that kind of stuff works so well with this world it's very uh, easily adaptable. Yeah, I, well, I would love to unpack that a little bit further, but um, just in in the interest of time, I think I'm going to move us on a little bit further into Harn Master. Um, Harn Master, fairly straightforward. Uh, it's got some kind of wonky terminology, just owing to I think probably its age, but it's it's basically a D100 roll under percentile system um, at its core. It's got some bolt-on products. Um, are you running that with like Harn Master Magic, uh, Religion, Barbarian, the whole nine yards? Um, yeah, we are. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the thing is that I would say that Harn Master Magic, Harn Master Religion, Harn Barbarians, all are kind of situational dependent. I mean, if you're playing a clerical if you have a clerical character in your game, of course you'll need harm religion to to access some of that. But it depends on how how high fantasy you're playing, right? Um, I've seen people who play um, harm clerics as real world clerics. Like their magical power are they can read, they they can uh, they have contacts in every city with their local temple. They can walk into a temple and have a place to stay and and get money and and borrow materials and stuff like that. That's their superpower, right? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, whereas you can also play with the sort of more D and D style, where the cleric gets uh, you know um, invocations from their god that will help them do certain things. Uh, but um, you know, it, it all depends on how you want to play it. And uh, again, with Harn Magic, I've seen people play where. They have powerful wizards who are part of their, their campaign and other campaigns where they play for years without ever actually encountering a wizard, without ever actually encountering magic. So it depends on how you want to play your game. And Harn Barbarians, I would say Harn Barbarians is, is you could play without it. The description of the different barbarian tribes is in the Harn World, uh, or Harn World book. So you could just go with that and and just roll up a character and play them with the main rules. The the advantage of Harm Barbarians is it adds more color, it adds more depth, uh, it helps you with fleshing out your character, where they came from, what their backstory is. But again, I would say that you could probably play a very successful campaign with just Harm Master, if you if you needed to. Um, and I know uh, so Richard plays with Harm Master One, which was the original version. 
And that had all the religion rules and all the magic rules and all the barbarian rules and the uh, bestiary all in one book. So oh, it can okay. be done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So at a, at a minimum, if someone is going to get into this, they're really looking at picking up Harn World, the Harn decks, which is, you know, a, a series of articles. And I think it's worth noting here that everything in Harn is structured as an article. Uh, let's see if we can get the, the old camera, pick this up. I might just throw that. Yeah, I'll edit that in. Don't worry about that. Um, but it, it is a different setup and it's, I am actually finding it challenging to read through, um, particularly the Harn decks because n every article is just about completely on its own. So I'll give you a little hint. Yeah, please. Don't don't read it A to Z. Okay. Take the map out, lay the map down, pick a spot on the map, look up that spot in the index, and then from there follow the road to the next town, turn to that spot in the index, and you will find it's it's like an encyclopedia, is you just use the the sections you need. You know, you don't need to read the whole thing, the whole 130 pages from beginning to end. It's and we're going to get into this a little bit more about how to how to start your campaign. One of the challenges a lot of people find is that that Harn is massive, right? There's there's you know million words in print, uh, and um, you know where do I start? And the thing is, uh, Harn is very medieval in that people didn't go very far generally. So start with one keep or one castle, get to know that area very well. Then look down the roads that connect that castle and where do they connect to and learn a little bit about the immediate uh, shire, the immediate area around it. And then as your characters grow and develop and become more important and, and have more effect, then they might move up to the kingdom level. And only at that point, do you really need to be an expert at your kingdom as a GM, you know, uh, when your characters are only around that one castle, all you need to know is the Baron who lives there his family, his troops, uh, his subordinates, and that, and you can work your way up as your characters become more important and uh, more influential, and you move up to the kingdom level, and then maybe you know, depending on your campaign, it might become between two kingdoms. So you might you might end up having you know to spread your characters or or learn about two two kingdoms, but you only have to really look as far as your characters are going to look, and that's where the I think the encyclopedia nature of Harn is helpful in that um, if you want to know what's down that road, you just look on the map. What is the next town? You can look it up. It'll give you like a one paragraph summary of that town. And you don't need to, you know, download and, and become familiar with a 40 page article just about that community because your players might just ride on through and go to, go to the next town, which my characters have done on occasion, I will say, after spending hours of preparation on a specific location, and they rode right <laughs> past it, and right. went off somewhere else. So, the GM well, I, I, I mean, I would say, I, I think I'm probably a good person to have on this podcast, because I've been illustrating this game for 20 years. I've been playing it since I'm 15. And I'd say, of the group that is currently working on Harn, I by far know the least. And I, and, and so... Some I have fans that will ask me, they'll send me a picture of an illustration I did that I barely remember doing, asking me what, like, like, do you know whose cousin this guy is? And I'm like, I, I don't even know who that guy is. So, it, I mean, the interesting thing, you know, I think you, you have this big hard world, hard decks book, and it is incredibly intimidating. And I would say what Carrie said is very true. Read what you need to read. You know, don't feel like oh, I have to memorize this book to run a game. You don't. I mean, I, I would argue you buy Harn World and Harn decks to figure out where you want to start. Pick a kingdom that feels like, oh, I can handle this. Buy that kingdom and and just have that for a while. And, and maybe the city where your characters start. Because you could not leave a city for five years of gameplay. I mean, you know, I mean, we played 
When I was 15, we started in Caldor. I don't think we left Caldor for 10 years of gameplay. We were in Caldor the whole time. And and eventually, I think we chased some goblins up into Azimir at some point. So something, you know, so the next, next thing you know, we're up there. So I really think, you know, the nice thing about Harn is you don't have to do a full buy-in. You buy what you need as you go. And the nice thing about it, too, is, you know, the way we do Harn quests, which we haven't really talked about, but we do a subscription service where we mail you 32 pages quarterly every year. You you might get an article in that that's in a different kingdom, but you think, oh, that's cool. I'll use ideas from that in my game in Caldor. You don't have to, you know, specifically say, well, I can't use that until they go all the way on the other side of the island. You can use parts of it. And so it's just great. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people who run, there are people who use Harn in their other homebrew worlds or you know, I know people even play Greyhawk and will use cities of Harn to use the Harns and Grey. I mean, you can use it multitude of ways. But, you know, I think the, the one thing is to just not get too intimidated. Buy the book, read it, and when something strikes your fancy, you're like, all right, well, I really like what's going on in Retham. Maybe I'll buy the Retham Kingdom. And then I really like, you know, Galatha sounds creepy. I'm going to buy Galatha. You know, so I mean, you just sort of, run down there and, you know, figure out what your players want to do. And if your players say, you know, we want to get on a boat and sail the other side of Harn, then maybe you need to, you know, purchase some other stuff. So, I mean, I think it's really nice that it's modular and you can grow it however you want. I mean, of course, you know, back here, I, you know, I have the luxury of, I have everything, but um, I, you know, there's, I read the stuff for me personally, you know, I get the articles from the writers and then I have to fill in the blank spaces where the art goes. And uh, I read what I need to, honestly. And sometimes I, I, I won't, I shouldn't admit this, but there've been times where I've misread things and my reading comprehension wasn't quite what it should be. And I've drawn the wrong thing. And then the writers are like, what, what were you reading here? And you, you drew, that guy's supposed to be 40 years older than what you just drew. So there, and uh, so it is interesting. You, I don't think you have to be a master of Harn to run it. I mean, I think that's the problem is it is, huge complete and complex but just i i think if you just narrow your focus it, it's it's wonderful that way because everything you need is there it's it's something to aspire to as, as opposed to being a requirement to get into right for sure yeah. yeah yeah one of the big things i would say too and and richard kind of alluded to it is also you don't have to use it as written i mean if you want to move things around and change things it's your game and you have the freedom to do that. And one of the things that I do encourage people to do is like you have sometimes where, oh, my God, you know, the players have suddenly gone off and they're going to chase down somebody at the mill. And I don't have the plans for a mill. Flip through your book, grab the plans from a different module, different country, different you know location. Boom. There you go. I got plans for a mill. We'll do the we'll do the big conflict. You know, the, the showdown with the bad guy in the mill. We'll use the the maps from another uh, you know article or supplement, and that's I think one of the big powers of of Harn is you have plenty of different examples of different castles, different houses, different townhouses, uh, different manors, all these sort of places, and you can kind of lay them in just depending on where your campaign is. So uh, again, I always encourage people don't. Don't uh, put it aside just because it's not in the area you want to game. Strip mine it for cool locations, for cool character ideas, for illustrations of, of bad guys or good guys and stuff like that. Take them from any place you want to and repurpose them in your own game. Yeah. Now, now there is a quick start. Um, there is, yep. It comes with an adventure. It's set kind of in Retham, kind of in... Um... I think uh, it's a kind of a sea-based voyage over to uh, Kande, perhaps. I think it was. It's been a little yeah, bit since I read a, it. Yeah, so there's a, we have a couple of kickstarts. Um, Field of Daisies is one which is set in Kaldor, and Deadweight is one that's set in Retham. So yeah, there's that, a couple of different, right. um, and and both of them have uh, a quick start set of rules, and they have pre-prepared characters. Um, which, uh, and I will be upfront about this, 
is one of the challenges with Harnmaster is the character creation front loads a lot of the work on the players. Like it can take several hours to create a character. So the quick start is really good because it provides you a set of characters already written, already developed, uh, and you can just play. And and then one of the things I, I like to encourage folks is play with those characters for, for uh, you know, a few sessions until you really get a feel for how the system works. And then you can go ahead and create a character that matches what you want to play. But uh, using the quick start characters really helps you um, see the system, play the system without having to do a lot of work. And it gives you a chance as a GM to introduce your players to the system at, without scaring them away with, you know, hey, we're going to spend our entire first session doing character creation. A lot of people are like, oh, that's too much for me. I don't want to even try the system. So, Well, the, and the other thing I would say, and I, I think you, the questions you're asking are sort of alluding to this, and that is, um, the, the current style of like D&D and even gaming has sort of mimicked, uh, I think, um, video games. And so I think, you know, when you get kids now who want to play, you know, they want this level up mentality. All right, I was successful. I should get a better weapon. I should be, you know, and then it's just this level up thing. And I think one of the things that I love about Harn is that, uh, you know, the character I talked about when I was 15 year, or I think I was 14 when I started playing this character, you have to kind of get your players excited to embrace the suck, you know? And it's sort of the thing that you are going to fail at most of the things that you are trying to do, much like a real world person. So you roll up your character and generally in, in Harn, you roll up a 17-year-old, roughly 17-year-old character who has some skills of, of some sorts, but they're not very good. And so, you know, you say, well, I'm going to go attack a monster. Well, you could, but generally what should be happening is if you see a monster, your your main skill is how fast you can run away. And, and until you figure out, all right, how are we going to do this? So I think in Harn, if you're using Harn Master, it, it is a bit of a challenge because the combat is very deadly. Um, and I think what happens is you, you have to get characters, you know, when you're playing, with, especially with teenagers, I've noticed this, you have to get used to them kind of enjoying the fact that they were going to do this spell and they rolled a wild misfire and their spell backfired and did the absolute opposite of what they were planning. And and I always tell people when when you play the game, you don't remember the grand successes as much as you do the grand failures. Those are the most fun you've ever had playing the game is when your wizard, you're in the middle of a battle, your wizard is trying to cast this crazy spell and he just sets himself on fire. And that's yeah. the story that you will tell for the rest of your life. That's the one that always comes up. And I, I mean, think Dungeon Crawl Classics is built exactly on that premise. Right. Like that's the whole system. <laughs> yeah. I haven't played that one. I've heard, I've heard a lot of good things about that one, but I, I, but it is interesting when kids are playing and you're introducing them, you have to, I think, you you know, some people say, well, I can never get my kids to play hard. And I think, well, it's sort of a psychology thing. You have to get them to enjoy the fact that they have to work their butts off to increase their character and get them better and be smart about, you know, I'm going to have to ask for help. You know, if we can't do this thing, so what do we do? Well, we need to find somebody to help us or figure out a way. We're going to have to work for a while to make the money that we need to do this thing. And it, it 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 gets more team building and more challenging things to happen, I think. And um, it's less. I mean, I, I do still think there's that idea that there aren't that many heroes on hard, but the heroes are probably your player characters. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's that going on. But at the same time, it's going to take like you know, like I said, uh, I played a character who was a, a surf who had to run away from home. And he was a mess. He, you know, the first session I, in my pregame, I almost drowned trying to cross the river to get away from the hue and cry of the town that was trying to capture me. So I almost, and we had another player who died in his pregame and he had to start over. He got, he basically uh, got caught doing the same thing, told the leader of the town to go screw himself and they hung him. So he's, and the DM's like, you can't do that. You got to roll up another character and let's try this again. And so I think 
it is interesting. It's so realistic. That's and it's people getting their heads into that takes a bit of a, a challenge. And Harn really allows for that. And all the information is there for that. If you're a surf, you can leave. You could maybe even become a great warrior, but it's going to be a challenge. And what what's it going to take? And the information the is other, there. Yeah. The other thing that I would I would emphasize as well is that Harn uh, Harn Master is extremely deadly combat. Like mm -hmm. you can you can be the best knight with the finest equipment and all the best training, and some guy gets a lucky roll and beheads you and you're dead. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it it is it is that deadly. So um I would say my biggest accomplishment as a GM was I had a group of players who were feeling out the system, getting to know it, and they they decided that. They were they were attacked by some brigands and they thought, well, we're heroes. We're gonna get into this, and they all nearly died, like <laughs> against a few ragged brigands, you know, because a couple of lucky hits and a, and a couple of fumbles on their part, and all of yeah. a sudden, you know, they've all got stabbed a couple of times, and and it was it was serious. So three or four weeks later, we're playing again, and they run into some gargan, which is the orcs of harm, right? And I knew I had I had communicated it correctly to them when their first thing was maybe we can negotiate with them. Like before we before we fight, maybe let's try and talk first. And um when when they did that, um I knew that they had understood that like uh, running yeah. in with swords drawn and, and attacking with no warning and, and no preparation is a really, really bad plan. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, what, what, and it was very successful. And, and I think that players, you know, again, as going with what Richard said, is the players like told tales of like, you know, nearly getting killed by simple brigands. And, you know, at the time we negotiated with the orcs and, you know, these become very important uh, role playing opportunities. Yeah. And, you know, with a system like that, it gives you a lot of opportunities, even just for like ransoming folks right like not oh, everything needs sure. to be a fight to the death and right. you know folks coming from D D don't get that like that is something that you need to train out of them so right right you know, that's that could be your way to riches um yeah yeah you know there's a lot of places you could take that so well we had another one recently where we were sent uh in our campaign the local barbarians got hired by somebody to burn one of the earl ships and and so the earl said well we need justice i want you to go get these barbarians and he said well also they've cost me a lot of money so i want you to get them try to not kill them capture them and i'm going to sell them to slavery to try to you know get some of my money back and so your whole goal is to go into a camp where they want to kill you and you're trying not to kill them. And of course, we came back with not as many slaves as we'd hoped because things didn't go the way we one one of our guys went berserk and ended up killing two of them. And we were like, well, I guess uh, we're not going to get as much money for the Earl as we'd hoped. But it is interesting that it allows it's not so white, you know, white and black. There's some gray areas in there. And you're like, well, would we kill this guy? Can we figure out a way to just injure him? And our master has the rules for that, you know, just, you know, figure out a way. So you can actually choose, uh, well, we're just going to start aiming for his legs you know, or something, you know, we're going to try to knock him out with a blunt weapon or something like that and just stun him so we can tie him up. So, I, you know, it allows for a lot more flavor and choices. And, and also you can say, well, we're just going to knock him out. And one guy rolls wrong and kills the guy outright. And you're like, well, there goes that plan, you know? So, and offers yeah. some really fun, interesting things that you're like, we weren't expecting that to happen. Well, the, the hard master combat is also so in depth that yeah. even if you're doing it sparingly or infrequently, or the outcome is not just like to slaughter everyone, right? It is a. It, it seems like it should be a very satisfying experience. I haven't actually gotten it to the table yet, um, but I, it, it's a departure it's, it's from very... the current modality out there. Yeah. Yeah, I would say Harn Harn combat is very um I want to say like visual or graphical in the sense that 
Um, you don't just, uh, you know, take away some, 10 points, 10 hit points away from the other character. It's you strike him in the upper arm and you break a bone or you uh, cut a gash or you leave a huge bruise or like it, it's very explicit in what you do. And that way at, you know, at the end of the battle, it's like, Hey, did you see when I cut that guy's arm off? Right. You know, like it's, it's not just a, Oh, did you see when I knocked off 14 hit points of that guy? Um, right. well, which also, is, you, can hit him, you can hit him in the arm and he can drop his weapon, which completely yeah. changes the fight, you know, at that point. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. Where D and D is abstract. It is explicit. Yeah. In, yeah. In what's going and on. I, and, I, and honestly, I don't think it's that much more difficult. And I will say, too, you know, we've been playing hard for a long time. There's a lot of the rules that we ignore. You know, there's stuff that we're just like, I don't want to calculate all this stuff. You know, and and there is the nice thing about Karn, I think, is that every once in a while where someone's like, what's the rule on this? And the GM will just say, I don't know. You have 50 percent chance, you know, and just roll the dice and see what happens. And then the result is like, I don't know, roll, you know, three versus your strength, you know, three D6 versus your strength. And we'll see what happens, you know. And then, so the nice thing about it is, if you know the core of the rules, it's easy to kind of make up your own rules on the fly. And you know, I think very few people who play Harn for any amount of time don't have a tremendous number of house rules or haven't borrowed other people's rules. I mean, we have we actually have a skill that we drug in from Dragon Quest just because we liked it, and so we we just assigned a skill base for it. It's called military science, where you can kind of assess you know strategy and all that kind of stuff and so you know you can grow it and build it as you need i think so it's it's nice that way yeah i, I think hard master is is a very intriguing system at least for me you know it's a bit simulationist it's a bit crunchy um some of the terminology i had to figure out was really just like oh it's your skill level and it's modified you know once you figure make that connection right they, you know, effective mastery level is is the term. But uh, right. once you figure out that it's just the modified skill level, it's like, oh, okay, everything right. makes sense. Everything clicks. Right. Yeah. Um, well, we are just about at time. Um, I wanted to ask each of you two things. One, uh, what are you most intrigued by that's coming down the pike? Because there are further hardbacks coming out. There's more coming with Harn Quest. Um, and what are you most excited about in your current games? So, Richard, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to probably burst Carrie's answer because mine's probably going to be similar. Um, as far as what's coming down the pike, I, I really was excited uh, last I Well, it's, I'm terrible with time. It's probably been two years now. But when we did, the Dwarven Kingdom. And I always thought the Dwarven Kingdom, as it was, was a little too scant and confusing. Like, things didn't necessarily make sense. And Carrie dove into that and really uh, got into the weeds of how that kingdom works and made it interesting. And we and we're still fleshing it out. There's a, the next thing, the next Harn quest are are more of the uh, abandoned city of Dwarven abandoned city of Karaz, which Carrie's working on. And uh, but the the thing I'm most excited about is we're going to do the same thing with the elves and the elves as they are written are very vague and weird. I mean, I, I think most people probably don't even use them because they're very tough to figure out how to work into your game. There's some stuff that's ambiguous and they just have, don't have enough to really work, fit into the world of Harn yet. And so Carrie's actually, Carrie and uh, Rob Barnes are actually writing that right now. So I can't wait to illustrate that because for one thing, that's the first thing I illustrated 20 years ago. And it's my least favorite art I've ever done for Harn, so I get to redo all of it. Um, and so I'm excited about that, to, to get into the elves and kind of flesh them out. And in my personal game, uh, we just started a new campaign uh, where we're going to get on a boat and go to some undiscovered um, areas of the world. And so it's a place that's never been written, so our GM's going to just kind of make it up. It's called Camerand. Which you know, we're, I, I mean, if you look at the world and kind of compare it to Earth, I'm, I'm, it's, it's similar to South America, or at least in that place. So it's probably going to be. I think when we get there, it's going to be Aztec-ish, Aztec-like uh, cultures and stuff. So I'm excited about that. We're just going to be on a boat and uh, 
exploring. And I'm playing a an Anglican priest who is going because he's heard rumors that there are, are uh, actual fuming gates, basically volcanoes. And so he's going to think think he can find entrances to where Agric lives. And so um, so that's what we're doing in our game. So I'm excited about that. Oh, that sounds like, like a blast. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And Kerry? Well, uh, as Richard alluded to, I, I'm working on uh, Evale, the Elven Kingdom, which is, uh, I think, going to be a lot of fun. We we did a lot with the with uh, uh, Azadmir to flesh out the dwarves as to who they are, what they do from day to day. Um, you know, how does their life uh, exist? So we're aiming to do the same for the elves. Um, I'm in the process of finishing off. Um, a supplement to the Karaz uh, uh, location. Karaz is kind of the Harnik small cousin version of Moria. It's a it's a former dwarven city that was wiped out, and now there's you know it's all uh, abandoned. Um, and so we're fleshing that out, adding a lot of a lot more spaces, a lot of of area for people to explore. Uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I mean. The, the key thing with uh, with Harn is there are dungeons in Harn, but they exist for a reason. They're not just a random place. They they were created uh, to fulfill a purpose. And so uh, that's one of the things we're going to explore. We're going to explore more of the mines of, of Karaz and, and some of the other key locations. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, the part that I'm uh, most looking forward to writing for the Veil vale source book is going to be the Codominium article. So mm. the Codominium was a period when the elves and, and uh, dwarves lived on Harn by themselves before the humans arrived. And so they had a much larger, they, they had uh, communities all over uh, the island of Harn. And those uh, communities have been abandoned for 1400 years or more. And so there's tons of potential for new ruins and stuff like that. So in my article that I'm working on, we'll include some hints of places to go explore where you might find uh, dwarven ruins or, or uh, you know, some sort of uh, elven magic and, and these sort of locations. So I think that will be a lot of interest for folks who want to incorporate a little bit of that uh, higher fantasy side of things. Uh, it'll still be very grounded, but I think it'll give a lot of cool potential locations for for uh, to to draw those player characters out into the wilderness, looking for that lost city and and stuff like that. So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm not currently running a Harn campaign uh, on my own, uh, but the one the the kind of we play it intermittently in between other sessions. Uh, we are playing a group of investigators. Uh, who are dealing with the lead up to the uh, Kaldoric Civil War? So there's uh, they've uh, they've discovered uh, that the former Archbishop of Kaldor was not actually assassinated. Uh, he was uh, knocked unconscious. They put a fake body in the in the casket and buried the fake body. And the uh, Archbishop is being held in a secret Lorrainian prison. And um, the uh, the players went there to rescue somebody else, and ended up finding out that the archbishop is still alive. So this brings all sorts of political turmoil into play within within our Caldor, and which may lead to a precipitous civil war. So we'll see. That's that sounds great. It, it ties into something I was just going to highlight in relation to Vale, which is. As I was reading through Harndex over the last couple of weeks, the little article on Vigist, uh in Setha Heath on the south south of uh, Caldor, that little snippet blew my mind. Uh, There's a whole article on that, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so Vigist has a whole article with with some very high fantasy elements and and. Uh, lots of potential for growth and we are actually looking at even further expanding that so we'll see yeah, how that all goes in the development that is one process. thing uh i will say is that uh th there's a lot of articles that have been done by columbia games or even fanon 
fan articles that are available online for free. And so, uh, you know, people have either, and sometimes there's multiple versions, so you can kind of grab what you need from each. So if people are trying to get into Harn, uh, you know, first thing I would say is, you know, you either get active in the forums, it's either the Facebook page, probably the more seasoned people are on the Harn forum. Um, yeah, uh, lithia.com. And, and also there's a connection on Lithia, their homepage, which has all the fan articles and, you know, you, you can search that you can get NPs, you know, Carrie's done an amazing big, uh, it's called friends, fiends and followers of, of NPCs that you can just pop in anywhere. And, uh, and a lot of them have been illustrated by me or, uh, uh, Jua who's done a lot of them. And so they're, you know, and that's the nice thing is I get hired by a lot of the fans to do, the articles, the fan articles. And so the fan articles often look exactly the same as the, you know, official stuff, but you can download them for free. And generally the rule is, uh, I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but Columbia Games likes it. If you do stuff that we're probably not going to publish usually, yeah. you know, so smaller manners, um, you know, just, you know, if you want to do a blacksmith in a town, you know, have at it. And so, uh, but a lot of times I've illustrated or they find somebody else pretty good, you know, and they're laid out very well. So, um, and the community is pretty welcoming. So if you have a question and you're like, you know, what do you guys think of this place? Just ask on the forum or, you know, message someone personally and they usually have the information and are really willing, you know, they were excited about the world. So if you ask the question, people are excited to answer it. Yeah, it's, it seems hugely collaborative, which is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few people that are pretty dogmatic about it. And, <laughs> I, you know, you just have to make sure that don't get too upset when someone says, oh, my God, you can't do that. You can do whatever you want. I mean, I, you know, I illustrate for it. And I feel like, you know, the only thing I, I do tell people is you can't use anyone else's art. You have to use my art. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's just do what you want. You know, it's your game. It's fun. You know, we're a bunch of grownups playing make believe. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, do what you want to do. Find, you yeah. know, just use the, the things you like. And if there's something in, in Harn that we've done, you're like, I don't like that. Change it. Do whatever you want, you know. So and I think it's it's such a great world for that. It's it, it allows for the user to use as they wish. Fantastic. Yeah. And I would further plug lithia.com. Um and you know, there if you go there, there are location articles. There are adventures, there are game aids. Uh, so, you know, a lot of those house rules that we were talking about before are located there. Um, as as uh, Richard mentioned, um, my friends, foes and followers series, uh, there's like 180 fully fleshed out uh, PCs with art. So you can, uh, you know, if, if you want to start a game and you just want to give, let everybody grab a character and go, there's a whole ton of them already made of every possible different profession. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, location wise, um, uh, there are every type of location you can imagine. There are dungeons, there are castles, there are manors, uh, there are townhouses, everything you could want. Um, and, and again, take it and put it wherever you need it in your campaign. Fantastic. Well, I, I will put links to those uh, in the description, uh, both here and on the podcast. Um, but I'd like one to thank final, One final plug yeah. real quick. Uh, I, yeah. I have a Patreon page where I do uh, I do three characters a month. And if you buy in, you get to download. Uh, and, you know, they're not specifically hard, but they're hard ish mm -hmm. And so they're illustrations that you can use in your game. And so... Yeah. Um, you know, people want to check that out as well. And yeah, if you can shoot me a link, I'll, I'll include it. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And and Carrie, if you have anything that you want to plug or all my stuff's on lithia.com yeah. or okay. uh, at Columbia Games. So uh, I, I at one point thought about creating my own uh, website, but then I thought, you know what? Let's put it all on lithia.com, and then everybody it's easy for everybody to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Harn is going through a renaissance. We might find ourselves here again at some point. Um, yeah. But thank you both for taking time out of your day. Um, sure. No, it's fun. We love to talk about it. Lots of fun. Well, thanks for joining us today. 
Hopefully you found that uh, interesting. And uh, I'm going to include some links to some other Harn videos in the description here, uh, as well as some of the other links that we discussed, uh, Richard's Patreon, Lithia.com. Uh, there's a really good series of videos that um, a channel called uh, Game Master Growth, formerly known as the Complex Games Apologist, put out a while ago, um, which was actually my introduction to Harn. And um, I'll include some of those there uh, in the description. I really think that uh, his video about the Caldoric secession, succession crisis is well worth a watch um, to help you understand, you know, some of the depths of this setting. Like if you're really going for a Game of Thrones style system, um, well, it doesn't have to be the system, but the setting, uh, Harn will deliver that in space. Uh, it's really cool. Also, a uh, big thank you to Richard and Kerry for joining me. Um, it was great to, to catch up with them. Um, if you haven't found your way to the Facebook page for Harn, uh, Friends of Harn in particular, uh, you should do so. Uh, that's one of the most active communities uh, out there right now, in addition to the forums on Lithia. So anyway, I uh, hope you all have a uh, happy new year headed to here, here into 2024, which is wild. Um, and I will catch up with you soon.